semblances helps us to explain and to deal uh, with that level of analysis issue. Um, a third uh, area that causes some difficulty or could cause some difficulty is the fact that uh, practices are very different from uh, site to site so that when academics are doing research they'll behave differently uh, from when they're doing learning and teaching. And uh, but I, here I'm going to draw on Bernstein. He talks about uh, what he calls the pedagogical device and notes that discipline as research uh, is different from discipline as curriculum. It's articulated differently in teaching discipline as curriculum than it is when uh, it's research practices uh, that are going on. So again, identifying the thing, essentialism, with its core characteristics becomes rather difficult because the site of practice matters. Granularity matters and the site of practice matters. So once again, Wittgenstein's argument about familial resemblances, I think, helps us to deal with those differences and yet sameness uh, issue. Finally, another problematizing issue is time. Disciplines do change over time, some faster than others, some very fast indeed. But again, we can still recognize them uh, as being the same uh, discipline. So granularity, time, uh, and the site of practice all mean that a discipline is articulated differently, different times, different places, and in, in different sites. And as I've already said, in terms of generative power, that too varies uh, according to uh, the particular situation. So what I'm saying really about disciplines is that they have multiple and variable uh, characteristics depending upon the sets of relations, the level of analysis uh, and the time that uh, we're looking at. But they do draw on a set of family characteristics um, that, so that we can recognize them. And Sayer again, Andrew Sayer, has uh, noted the importance of moving away from hard categorical boundaries and taking the kind of approach that I'm uh, suggesting in detail here. He says that trying to establish hard categorical boundaries, for example, around tribal territories, conceals, this is a quote, conceals fuzzy, complex, shifting transitions, with the distinctions often being the subject of social struggle. In particular, uh, familiar bipolar distinctions suppress difference and hybridity. And really, that's what I'm talking about here difference and hybridity, to try to look for disciplinary territorial borders and to fix them, to map them uh, for all time and all circumstances is wrong. Disciplines are the site of struggle and change. They vary, uh, they, they vary in practice and they vary uh, as to how you uh, look at them as well. So how is it that we come to recognize disciplines? How is it that we establish in our minds these familial resemblances? How do we come to know that sociology is sociology and not, uh, for example, history? Um, this brings up the issue of, uh, a very important issue, of when is a thing not a thing? And, and Virch, for example, in uh, thinking about social practices, has used the example of the pole vaulter using a new, a new technology, a new kind of pole, and people saying, are they really doing pole vaulting? Or uh, Oscar Pistorius, uh, the so-called Blade Runner, very relevant in a South African context, of course. Was he really running the 400 meters uh, when he had those blades uh, to help him, or a child in school doing uh, arithmetic with a calculator. Are they really doing arithmetic? The really there is uh, a very important question. Now I would say that in trying to recognize, for example, the discipline of sociology, we don't have in our heads an enormous rule book uh, of characteristics that we're looking at. What's happened, I would say, is that a form of connectionist learning has gone on, and here I'm drawing again on Turner. Uh, Turner's work, that over time we have a series of experiences uh, about from which we infer an understanding of a concept and we apply our inferences and from the feedback we receive uh, 
uh, we establish whether we've correctly inferred uh, our understanding uh, or not. So we're not learning rote fashion a rule book. We're having a series of experiences, we're making connections in our minds, and we're beginning to come to an understanding as we use those and get feedback on whether we're using them correctly or not. A lot of language learning, uh, first language learning, is, is like that. Nobody ever teaches us the meaning of words like however, for example, we infer them. So in the same way, we're, we're by inference, by connection, connectionist learning, we're inferring the meaning of uh, terms like uh, sociology. We're developing a set of uh, ideas and we're applying them when we look at the world. There is a grouping of elements, a set of familial resemblances uh, in disciplines, of course, and it's interesting to think about what they are. I would say they're things like patterns of discourse that you can identify across different disciplines, a set of concerns, research concerns and so on, uh, conceptual theoretical tools, um, a disciplinary saga, a kind of history, a set of knowledge resources, of course, concepts and so on, theories, um, and a set of conventions of appropriateness that might be more or less rigid about research and teaching, as well as a dominant set of assumptions around issues of epistemology and ontology. But as I say, those are not core characteristics that need to be there. They are the components of uh, familial resemblances. And through connectionist learning, they give us a sense of, well, what Bourdieu calls a sense for the game, or what Giddens uh, calls a practical consciousness, an understanding that is usable, that we can apply. Uh, so, for example, uh, to give something that, uh, to give an example that might be a bit closer to home for some of you, marking criteria, when we're, when we're judging a student's essay and trying to give it a grade, of course we've got marking criteria, the rule book, if you like, but the experienced uh, teacher and examiner doesn't actually look at the marking criteria, doesn't need to look at the marking criteria. Um, they actually know from experience through the inferences that they've made, through the inputs that they've had, uh, what kind of level we're talking about here. And in fact, the attempt that marking criteria make to capture levels and so on is always going to be doomed to failure, as Alison Wolf showed us back in 1995 in thinking about competence-based education. Um, so what we've got essentially is the functional equivalent of a set of rules that help us to uh, recognize these family resemblances. They're not rules themselves, but they do the job uh, of rules. And those functional equivalents are situationally contingent. Uh, they depend on the context at which the rule equivalent is applied, as I say, from university to university, from situation to situation, and from uh, the s different sites uh, of practice. And they're teleorelative, in other words, they're dependent upon the ends that uh, people are putting them for, the needs that, they, uh, that, that are being addressed at the time. So they're purpose relative. Uh, so we, what we've got, is, in a sense, is a, a very complicated situation uh, with different sites of practice, different levels of analysis, uh, and so on. And so, for example, as Chris Winberg has uh, shown us, uh, Chris from the uh, from Seaput, uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, if you take the example of mechanical engineering or architecture, what you see is a different articulation of that discipline in, in different sites of practice. So, for example, uh, an architect uh, articulates that discipline differently in the lecture theatre, in the field, uh, at the drawing board, and so on. It becomes essentially a different thing, and yet we can still recognise it as architecture. So just to draw to a conclusion then, I began uh, the talk by saying that disabling dualisms close down alternative ways of thinking. They create, uh, they create ontological tunnel vision and inhibit explanations. I'm drawing on Sayer in that. So what does a moderate, less dualist position open up and enable us 
to do in terms of thinking about disciplines? Well, uh, I think the first thing it does is to help us extend beyond Bernstein's discipline as research and discipline as curriculum, uh, discipline as it's articulated in the research field and discipline as it's articulated in the classroom, to think about the other sites of practice that academics engage in, for example, in committee work, in the politics uh, of what they do, in uh, placing applications for funding, and so on. The discipline is recontextualized and re-articulated in those different sites of practice. So I think it's quite helpful to think about, uh, in terms of research, how that happens and what happens to the discipline as, for example, um, a philosopher uh, or a uh, social work academic sits in a committee and uses their discipline, applies their discipline for particular purposes, for example, to get resources uh, and so on. So I'd like to extend the notion of Bernstein's notion of the pedagogical advice um, to these other sites of practice and to recognize, as Sue Matheson does, that disciplines are socially situated and that matters. And secondly, just to conclude, as I say, I think it's really important to uh, recognize that disciplines are articulated differently in different social uh, situations at a broader level, different universities. So, for example, sociology, uh, as it's expressed at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Italy, a Catholic university, obviously, will be very different, I think, from sociology as it's expressed at uh, Lancaster or as it's expressed perhaps at Rhodes University uh, in Grahamstown. Uh, sociology will be a different thing in smaller uh, or bigger ways. And yet, uh, when we go to those different universities, we'll see things that we recognize as well as things that perhaps strike us as uh, surprising. And uh, Paul Ashwin and his colleagues have written interestingly on this in their chapter in the new uh, Tribes and Territories uh, book. And um, lastly, I think it's important, as I say, to recognize that the generative power of disciplines waxes and wanes over time, both in the long and the short term, and between contexts of different universities and different sites of practice, research, teaching, committee work, and so on. So it's not possible to make any general statements about the power of disciplines other than, I think, probably a broad statement to say that their power in general has waned over time as other forces uh, have um, begin to, begun to impinge uh, on uh, practices in universities. So other forces such as technologies, ideologies, marketization, globalization, and the rise of the uh, evaluative state, as, as uh, Neve calls it. Uh, so um, the, the, the generative power and the statements we can, say, we can make about uh, that generative power uh, is highly variable. So uh, as researchers then, I think my argument has been that um, we need to be careful in designing our research and in thinking about our research questions not to go too far to either end of the essentialism, social constructionism, uh, dualism. To recognize that the truth claims that we can make about disciplines, the power of disciplines and so on, need to be somewhat circumscribed. And in trying to establish what we mean by a particular discipline, to recognize that some of the characteristics that have been taken for granted in the past actually are more like familial resemblances than necessary, always necessary, core characteristics of a discipline. So I think this argument then has quite significant implications for the research we do, and in particular the close-up research that we do into disciplines in universities. Thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'll look forward to uh, having a question and answer session with you uh, shortly. Thanks.